Hi there. Good afternoon and welcome to today's Worship on the Water Sundays at 6 online. We are so grateful that you are here with us this soggy Sunday. And we can't wait to be back in person with you soon. Just a couple of announcements. First of all, we want to thank you so much for being part of our Temple Hunger Food Drive. You can see information on that and the success of that online um, in our food blast. Uh, we were able to have multiple truckloads of food that went to Feast Gathering UMC, that went to Snipes Academy, Walking Tall, Wilmington, Nourish North Carolina, and Mother Hubbard's Cupboard. And so we say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of that. We've got a blood drive coming up on February 15th that you can sign up for online or by calling the church office. And also a new members class. If you're interested in joining Rights Hill and being part of our church family, we are going to be offering a new members class at 9.30 a.m. March 6th on Zoom. So we invite you to join us for that. We also would love to invite you to continue to give. You can do that through giving by um, check to P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach 28480, online at wrightsvilleumc.org or on the Wrightsville app. And last but not least, we are so grateful that today our message is going to be brought to us by Reverend Carol Perry. Carol is a pastor here. Reverend Carol was here from 1985 to 1996, where she and David, her husband, their younger daughter, Lindsay, was born while she was pastor here. Reverend Carol has served as district superintendent in the United Methodist Church and was actually my district superintendent when I was going through the ordination process. And right now she serves as a coach with Passion and Partnership that coaches new clergy. And also she is in retirement, a very active member of Wrightsville as part of our outreach efforts to Snipes, our racial unity group, and teaching deep dives into Christian discipleship on YouTube. And so we're so excited to have her give the message today. And now I invite you to maybe send a text to pass the peace of Christ to your neighbor. May the peace of Christ be with you. Let's pray. O oh, gracious God, who opens our eyes, who calls to us and hears us when we call, open our eyes today. Open our ears today. Open our hands to serve and love to one another today. Give us feet that are anxious to do your will. Oh God, in these dark, cold days, in these confusing days, in these sad days, give us light, give us hope, give us warmth, and give us love. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hopefully we will be back next week in person on the water. And until then, I invite you to sing along with our band as we start our service. Hear the reading of God's Word from Mark's 
Gospel, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. And they called him to be still, and Jesus then stood still and said, Call him here. So they called the blind man, saying to him, Well, take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Friends, it's good to see you this morning. I can't actually see you, and I wish that I could, but it's good to be with you in this virtual space, worshiping God. And I welcome you to Wrightsville, to this service of worship, and, and to any ministry that is uh, part of the church's life and the community's life together. This morning, um, I am sharing with you from one of my favorite texts in the scriptures, one of my favorite stories in the Gospels. So let us pray as we enter into God's Word. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as this is one of my favorite Gospel stories, let me tell you why. It's a multi-layered story, as Mark tells it, a story that offers us so much about Jesus, about people, about some who see and some who don't, some who can't 
and some who won't. And it offers us much about our hope for the future. At first glance, we recognize only a couple of characters in the story. There's Jesus and a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. It's an account of Jesus' healing of Bartimaeus, restoring his sight. Now, just a couple of chapters prior to this one, Jesus, according to Mark, healed another man of blindness, a man at Bethsaida in Mark's eighth chapter. Jesus, in that account, used his hands and his own saliva, gradually healing the man's eyes. But for Bartimaeus, Jesus offers just a word. Go, your faith has made you well. Then with his sight immediately restored, Bartimaeus becomes one of Jesus' followers. Both of these men, the one unidentified but at Bethsaida and Bartimaeus were physically blind. But of course, there are other kinds of blindness. And we who are not a part of that very, very small percentage who suffer with limited to no sight may need to remember that this is a story that incorporates other forms of blindness as well. Sometimes we say, for example, that love is blind. Well, true enough, we tend to overlook or not even to see at all a character flaw or disturbing behavior in someone we really love. We lose all objectivity to affection, even if the problem is very obvious to everyone else. There's something I would call obstinance, some things we just don't want to see. When my children were younger and still at home, it fell to one of them each week to take out the trash the night before collection day. More than once on the morning the canister was supposed to be at the curb ready for pickup, I'd find a trash bag, almost full, sometimes overflowing still under the kitchen sink. Why was the trash not taken out? Well, there wasn't any trash. I didn't see any. What? Are you blind? Of course I didn't say that. I exercised excellent restraint, but you know I wanted to say it. And instead I told myself it's easier for me to do it myself. And of course it isn't either. And such an attitude produces a kind of blindness in me. But there is another kind of blindness as well. We have maybe, or we know people who have experienced seasons of just darkness and feeling isolated, shrouded in darkness, searching desperately for a way out, a way to regain our faith and our footing. Even people of deep faith and wisdom have experienced times like these. The disciples, you remember, were in Jerusalem and they denied knowing Jesus in the last week of his life among them. And then later, after that denial, after he was crucified, they hid in the darkness and shelter of the upper room to avoid a fate like his. We read of St. John of the Cross, a 16th century Roman Catholic mystic who wrote a poem and then later a commentary about periods of spiritual darkness that he called the dark night of the soul. John Wesley, who started the Methodist movement in 18th century England, found himself faithless and, and frightened in the midst of a powerful storm. The storm was during his journey from America back to his home in England. And it followed a crushing experience where he had just left a mission that ended badly after it had begun badly and he was grieving his failure. So feeling guilty, abandoned, alone for months after that experience, his too was like a dark night of the soul. Mother Teresa, 20th century saint, confessed that she too struggled with doubt. We could go on and on. Amanda Gorman wrote these beautiful words for the inauguration of President Joe Biden. 
and they were written on a day of violent assault on our nation's capital. She writes, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, the sea we must wade. Depression, guilt, failure, confusion, create a spiritual blindness over which we ourselves have little power. That healing is in God's hands. But we find in Isaiah words of the Lord who promised hope. I will lead the blind by the road they do not know. By paths they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. That's a promise, a promise that we see fulfilled each and every day if our eyes are open to it, a promise that we see fulfilled here in the story of Bartimaeus. Not just one person's blindness was healed that day. As Mark tells us, Jesus' disciples had high hopes for Jesus and by their association with them, with him, high hopes for themselves. As a people of, of that time, they had endured oppression under the Roman occupation. They'd never had much money. They'd never had any status. But in Jesus, they saw a leader, one who bravely took on the religious establishment and any other challengers of his identity and purpose. In their minds, it was only a matter of time till Jesus established a whole new kingdom. And they began to chatter about who'd get the best appointment to his cabinet. So Jesus answered brothers James and John, who'd been arguing about who was likely to get the corner office. And he said, ask them, what do you want me to do for you? Well, give us positions of honor. I'm paraphrasing, but that's essentially what they said. And Jesus replied, again in my paraphrase, you really are clueless, aren't you? You don't even know what you're asking. Well, no, of course they didn't, because they couldn't see clearly who Jesus was, what he came to do, how he wanted to accomplish so much for all. Apparently, it was much easier to heal a physical condition than a spiritual one. But Jesus asked Bartimaeus the very same question he posed to James and John. What do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus was simple. I want to see. I want to see. And with a word... Your faith has made you well. Bartimaeus, hearing the words, received not only sight, but his life again. Now, the same could not be said for the disciples, but for Bartimaeus, his sight and his life. He must have been blind for a very long time, and while we have no awareness as to the cause of that blindness, we do know that because of the disability, he was forced to beg, forced to suffer indignities that we can barely imagine. And for all intents and purposes, he was almost at the lowest rung of the social ladder. And so a lot of people probably thought he wasn't worthy of Jesus' time. Some may have even thought he deserved to be on the side of the road blind, begging, and Mark tells us that at the time Jesus stopped, Bartimaeus was on that side of the road as far away as the able and the elite could push him. But when he had heard that Jesus was coming, he began to call out, and while others tried to silence him, he persisted, Jesus, have mercy on me. 
You can hear his desperation. You can hear his determination as well. This is a man I know will help me. I can't let this opportunity be taken from me. And isn't it curious, friends, that the one without sight is the one with the most insight into Jesus? No one in Mark's gospel thus far has been able to perceive so much about the Savior. But Bartimaeus sees who Jesus is. This is God's agent. This is the embodiment of mercy and compassion and love. This is, as we have known him to be called, Emmanuel, God with us. And here it gets really interesting because while Jesus is walking with his followers by his side and just behind him, he hears the blind man cry out to him and he stops. And he says, call him, bring him here to me. So the very crowd that had tried to silence the man is now asked to assist in bringing Bartimaeus to Jesus. So by Jesus' design, they're becoming collaborators in his ministry. This was just as God had commanded because God intended that we would not ignore the needs of the poor, the blind, the lame, the leper. We'd care for them as God does. We'd see them as God does. Jesus invites those who were trying to rebuke him now to participate in this same care giving. And in doing this, he's effectively turned the table on the disciples. He's exposing their blindness. They can't see Jesus, or at least not what he represents as savior of the world. They can't see Bartimaeus as a Bartimaeus rather as an equal. They can't see their own participation in disregarding the poor and the broken and the hopeless. but he presents us with the same choice. Mark presents us with the very same choice, to participate or to continue on our way, to open our eyes and see Jesus for who he is and what matters to him, or to disregard what is right there in front of us. It's a story that's told in this as well as other Gospels, but I want to be sure we hear the good news here. The good news is that Jesus sees us, all of us, clearly and with a love that is boundless, a love that is forgiving, a love that will not force itself upon us. He sees us and recognizes our blind spots. He wasn't trying to condemn the disciples, but rather to confront their limitations and give them a choice to confess their need for healing or to continue on their way. The same choice he gives to each of us. You know, we all have blind spots. Sometimes our blind spots may be our inability to see the pain and the frustration of illiteracy but if we saw it, we know we could do something about it. Maybe it's not being able to see the longing of an immigrant seeking a safer, freer life. Not everyone can see the consequences of a single nation that consumes 75% of the Earth's natural resources. Maybe we can't see the inequity of a vaccine distribution that at this point means Africa will not get a vaccine until 2022. Could we do something about it if we could see clearly? Do we want to see clearly so that we can be empowered to be a part of the solution with Jesus? Sometimes I don't get it. I can't see it. I'm seminary trained and theologically blind. I'm not sure how to reconcile all the losses due to COVID-19 with a God I know to be good and generous. Jesus, 
Have mercy, I want to see. And the answer that comes to me, as it did to Jesus' followers, is this, your healing comes through your participation in my work. For I came not to be served, but to serve. Once again, our poet laureate brings forth an image. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation. Our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. We will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. A wondrous world. And then images from the scriptures of a lion and a lamb together, of rich and poor together, of slave and free together, and male and female together, raising a wounded world to a wondrous one. We remember that Bartimaeus at the beginning of the story, is on the side of the road. And at the end of the story, he is on the road with Jesus, following him, engaging in the very things that Jesus does with the very people that Jesus loves. Jesus longs to heal and restore our sight so that we can see clearly what's broken, who's in despair, and how the strengths of a few can become the power of the many. What do you want me to do for you? And he's asking that of you and of me. So why is it so hard to heal the blindness of those who are closest to Jesus? Is it as Archibald MacLeish has said? Religion is at its best when it makes us ask hard questions of ourselves. It's at its worst when it deludes us into thinking we have all the answers for everybody else. Hard questions. We learned last week that among the nominees for the Nobel Peace Prize 2021 are two nominations with roots in the United States. First, former President Donald Trump was nominated for his accomplishments in the Israeli-United Arab Emirate relations under the Abraham Accords. The other, the Black Lives Matter movement was recognized for its ability to raise global awareness and consciousness about racial justice. Now, the one who submitted the nomination, whose name I will surely butcher, Petter Eide of Norway, traced the beginning of Black Lives Matter to 2013, following the acquittal of the man who shot Trayvon Martin. Then in 2014, the deaths of Michael Brown and Eric Garner, both of whom died as a result of police brutality, and then the deaths of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd in 2020. Many of these circumstances led to protests, mostly peaceful ones, but they were intended, all of them, to raise awareness of injustice and racism. One positive outcome cited in the nomination is that a lot of people have recognized their own blindness to people of color. Blindness to racism as a social pandemic. Blindness, not only in the US, but also in Africa and much of Europe and indeed all over the world. The good news, Jesus came to seek and to save the lost, to heal the blind, to set free the captives. And a word of hope? Well, once again, 
from our poet laureate. A new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to be it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, sia santificato il tuo nome. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. God is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 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 May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and keep you safe, secure, and seeing. Amen.